if you were here last week, <clears throat> this vision is like chapter 7 2. Like it's like the second kind of version of, of all, all of this. And, and today we're looking at uh, goats and rams. Like that's really what, what this one is all about. So this, to just get right into it, the, this chapter has a scary vision again. A scary dream for Daniel. That he, he sees that there is this... Uh, two-horned ram that is just running all over the world. And it's just destroying everything in its wake. This ram just has, you know, it's just destroying everything and it's scary. And then at some point, a goat comes out with one big horn and, and it comes and it actually destroys the horns on the ram. And it is now charging and taking everything over in its wake. Coley read it a little bit ago, and it's just, I'm just summarizing what happened there. And it's scary, right? Like, you know, the, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's ferocious. It's a strange vision. And it makes me ask, makes me ask you a question. Do you have any personal experiences with like rams or goats or anything like that? Because if you do, you're like goats, goats and rams are evil things. They just are. If you've ever had to deal with them, I'm getting some very assured looks from the back, right? No? No, you, you, like, you like goats and rams? Like goats and rams are just, they're, they're like, they're awful. Like I, I think you could take, you could take, for instance, like whenever you think of like, uh, like, 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 like if you have a picture of like Satan in your head, he probably has like goat horns on him. See, like over the, if you think of like Satanist stuff, you're like, you or the, like all the old visions of like Satan or the devil running around. He had like goat legs and stuff like that. Like this is a long time coming that the goats and rams aren't necessarily the, the most uh, savory animals. I think it comes back, back to the way their eyes look. You know that they got like rectangles for eyes, right? Look at that. It's not to be trusted, right? So, so in, I, per, I have personal stories about this. I really haven't. A lot of people, I don't think they... I grew up on, my parents had five acres of land. We had horses and stuff like that. Beasts, beasts of burden is what those horses are. And, uh, and so they, we, had, we, had, we, had, uh, we had all these things. Well, my, the, the people next door to us decided it was good for them to, um, th them to start raising sheep. And, uh, and the... The ram with that with that sheep full. Well, there's a couple of things that went bad as soon as we, they would start raising sheep. One, we had a collie. We had a big black collie. His name was Gracie, and and Gracie was a sweet, lovable dog that loved to be sweet and less so lovable to baby lambs when they were born. And so we would they would like the baby lambs would be born, and all of a sudden they would start appearing like underneath our porch. And it was a rough life on them. Like, and that was, it was a sad time in my life when I was 12. I had to deal with a bunch of deceased lambs. But that's uh, because of my dog wanted to play with something. But, but it, was, it was over here. But what would happen also, and I th I'm trying to remember his name. I think his name was Philly. Philly, the, sh the, the sheep's ram, would come over to our property every now and then just for a visit. And here's the thing. Many of you, you probably have had the same interaction with a ram, right? You could just be minding your own business outside, and, and you would, all of a sudden, it would just charge you and try to ram you for no reason at all. Like, I can remember being outside and just walking around, and you'd go around the corner, and all of a sudden, Philly is there, and he catches eyes with you, and you must have, like, D disgraced something in his family in the past instantly and he felt that you needed to perish now because of it right you 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 question his dominance over your own land right and, and so he would always charge you and here's the thing when I was like 10 11 12 that's when this, this neighbor of ours had all these sheep and if Philly was in our property you didn't go outside he took away our privilege to go outside my dad has the best story, and I witnessed this happen. My dad was in the back of the property, in the back, and it, it, my, my parents' property is kind of that shaped. 
you know, and it's, it's down in the bottom corner, and, and he's down there, and he was, I think he was repairing a fence or something like that. He's back down there, and he heard something behind him, and what he heard was Philly doing the thing like they do right before they charge, you know? And he looked behind him, and he had to dive out of the way, and, you know, and the, and the ram, like, hit the fence, and my, and my dad's like, oh, no, you know, I'm, I'm out here in the open, out thing. He, I, and I, I could hear him, like, yelling, out, out thing. And when I walked out on the back porch, I could hear him like he was having to like stop, dive out of the way as the thing charged at him, run as far as he could, turn around, stop, dive out of the way and run. He had to get back. to That's how he got back to the house. And I'm just watching this. I'm like, I'm not getting involved. Right. <laughs> like, like that. That's like, like uh, over there like that. That's, you know, it's these things are, 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 are terrible. They look sweet. They're not right? And so when you, when you read Daniel here, it makes, it makes sense if you had to spend a lot of time, like just chaos running around. Because I understand it. When, when Philly was over at our house, I was no longer free to go jump on my trampoline. I just couldn't do it. Like it was just, I couldn't, I couldn't go outside and ride my bicycle. I had to stay inside because the, the, the terrible beast was outside and it was going to hurt me, you know? Like, like that's, that's how it is. And, and like I thought of that as I read this dream. And I was like, this is, this is a real fear. It's a real fear that they have here. That, that, these, that these rams and these goats are running around everywhere just destroying everything. And you can't do anything about it because they're giants. And I, and I think there's a certain level where that speaks to us today. That for some reason that there's rams and there's goats that are running around that they look like they're big and powerful and in charge and they're, we're just watching them destroy what we would love and what we do and, and all these things and we just feel powerless against them. You see, you see that? Like, and, I, and, and I think that's kind of the vision that Daniel wants us to get of this. That it's the goats and the rams charging around. Now, when you, when you read the whole chapter, and I encourage you to read all of chapter 8, you end up finding out that the ram stands for Persia, and the, and the goat that comes in stands for Alexander the Great. So Daniel is in Babylon right now, and the ram Persia comes and destroys Babylon and takes him into that. And then afterwards, Alexander the Great of the Greece comes and takes over all of that area too. And it talks about how there's this one horn that comes up out of, out of the goat, out of Alexander's kingdom, and he's the one that destroys the worship of in Jerusalem. He's the one that gets rid of all the sacrificial system. They, he, this guy, he sacrifices a pig on the, on the altar in Jerusalem. Can you imagine that? And he set it up as a worship space for um, Zeus. And, and he did all this. And can you imagine being a Jew in that time and day? Can you imagine being part of God's people then? How powerless you would feel. That you held this spot in Jerusalem so sacred and you're watching the goat just run all over it and trying to hurt your dad as he's trying to get to the house, you know? Like it's, he's just running over and destroying everything that you know and love. You know, it's, I really, that, that really speaks to me, and I hope it speaks to you. Because it seems like in this culture of, that we live in today where you, you, it never has enough. You know, there's, there's never enough. There's, you got to always have more and more and more. I, I mean, think about the pressures that are put on us all. Think about when you were parents, and, and, you, and you had to raise up your children in a certain way, right? 
And, and, and now there's all kinds of pressure from like mommy blogs and all these, all these things that are going up and it's like, you got to raise them up perfectly. They got to do this, 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 and this. And it's just a factory of just discontent and feeling like you never measure up, right? Or, or when, you, when you were working and you felt, and you felt like that, where, where your job, you, just, it never, you never felt like you were measuring up at all. You never felt like you were doing enough. It felt like just the rams and the goats were just running all over you, controlling and destroying everything so much that you wanted to scream, Right? And even re in retirement, where well, you're supposed to be resting now, right? Like you have all these expectations. Your, your, your kids are messed up in this way, or your neighbor has done something to mess up their life this way, or you're, you're doing this or that, and, 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 and you feel all these burdens just are coming up onto you. You should have been fine financially, right? And, and now, like, there's just more and more burdens coming in each and every day, and it feels like, the goats are just running all over it, and you're even too scared to go outside. I mean, look how we treat politics. If you don't vote a certain way, you are the devil, right? That's the goats speaking. It's the goats that are running over everything that says you gotta, you gotta get in line and you gotta be just this way or you're not whatever. You know, the goats are just running over it and it makes us scared to even be involved. And it makes us where we sit back and timid and we're just like, I don't know if I can handle this anymore. You know, because we, put, we put all, have put all of our identity and all of our, all, all of our stuff in those baskets and we're, and, and we're watching the goats just run over everything. I think that's what it looks like to Daniel in his vision. That the goats are just running over everything. You know, he's, Daniel's trying to serve this Persian king, but this, this goat king is coming and he's trying to ruin everything. He's coming and charging. And let's, let's, let's look here near the end of Daniel. This wasn't in our, in our reading in the, in, the, um, in the bulletin. It's actually underneath that. But it's talking about that horn of the goat. And, and this, is, this, is, um, this is talking about that, the, the, the king that sacrificed the, uh, the pig on the altar in Jerusalem to Zeus. And he's saying, by his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. It, does that sound like anything? And in his own mind, he shall become great. You know, kind of that boastful idea. Like without warning, he will just destroy many. It's the goats are charging all around. And it says, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. Now that's actually like a title for God. And, and it says that he shall even rise up against God himself. And he will be broken, but by no human hand. You see that? Like it's, it's talking about how he's going to rise up and it's going to feel like there's no control over it. But right at the end, it says, but something's going to break him and it's not going to be by any human hand. It's not going to be some revolution that you start. It's not going to be any of these things. And in fact, it's kind of calling back to Daniel chapter 2 when there was that huge image that was built to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's, you know, in that, that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And then it was destroyed by, by a stone that wasn't fashioned from any human hand. And what it's telling us is that the great and terrible reign of the nasty goat, it's all just temporary. And I think that's good news for us. 
I think that's good news because when we look out at the world today, we can feel down and blue and we feel, we can feel like we need to fight back and you know, all, all that stuff and we can, and all that stuff. And, and what Daniel is, is like, God has got this. He's all under his control. It's only temporary. Peter talks about this too. Now, I like Peter a lot. I like, and you know Peter, like one of Jesus' disciples. I like Peter a lot. And the reason why I like Peter is I see a lot of myself in Peter. Um, I've gotten better at it over the years, but I tend to be a bit impulsive. I, I often say things that I end up regretting later. Like all, all, all these things. Sometimes, just by sheer charisma alone, I can save myself. But other times, I, I end up finding out what my feet taste like, right? And, and, and I think Peter understood what his feet taste like a lot. You know, when you, when, you, when, you, when you listen to him, and the Gospel of Mark is Peter's story. There's a lot of foot and mouth that happens in the Gospel of Mark on Peter's end. And I think because Peter understands what the taste of his own foot is, I think he's able to convey a message of hope to us all. Now, I'm going to see if I can put my foot in my mouth real quick. So, writing this sermon was difficult. All right? I'm going to tell you why. I was at a pastor's conference in Daytona, and I know what you guys are all thinking. You know, oh, pastor's conference, it means we're wearing our robes, right? And we're up in Daytona, and all we do is we go into a room and we pray the whole time, right? Yeah, that's sure, right? <laughs> like, like we, uh, no, what, what actually is going on, we usually have a great speaker. You know, hopefully we have a great speaker. We had a great speaker this last, this, this last one. And, uh, and it's all my colleagues from the Florida, Georgia district, and we're all getting together, and we're having a good time. We're listening to these speakers, and uh, we, we usually go out and have some drinks. Like, like, yeah, all right, that keeps the, the foot out of my mouth, right? And then, so we go out, and there's all these important people that are good to, like, rub, rub shoulders with, and, and stuff like that from the district, and people, you know, from Senate, and all that stuff. So, so you go out there, and then you have a few drinks, and, and you have a good time, and then your buddy Mark, who you write all your sermons with, goes, you know, we need to go back to the hotel room and write, write a sermon, you know. <laughs> That's this sermon. <laughs> And, 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 and he, and, and so we go in, you know, it, it's, I was driving, so I wasn't that deep into it, but you know, like, like all that stuff, but, but we go in and we have to write the sermon. So we're writing what you're listening to right now. It's very meta what's going on at the moment, but there's a reason why I want to get to that. Cause I'm talking about Peter and when he and I were discussing all of this, you know, remember we're a few drinks in as we're writing this and Mark looks, looks at looks at me, and he goes, our first Peter passage, that, that, that passage means the world to me. And, and, he, and he said, the, the, the reason why is that that's the passage that I always read after my father died. And he goes, that's the passage that got me through. He goes, that was the passage that I would read when I couldn't handle class anymore. Because he, he was in high school. He was a high school senior when all that happened. When he couldn't handle class anymore, when he couldn't handle the pressures of University of Florida anymore, he would go to the bathroom and he would read this verse. I had no idea that that's what we did when we planned this out two years ago when we planned this sermon series. And this, and this, is, and this is it. He goes... In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by so many trials, so that the tested genuineness of the faith, even more precious than gold that perishes through, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the results in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. And then here we go, next section. 
Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith and the salvation of your souls. And, and he goes, you know, after looking at Daniel, he said, after the running, after realizing that the running of the rams and the goats in my own life, and I didn't know which way was up after the passing of my father, I would run to this verse that all it talks about is from a guy that says, you know God loves you. Even though you may not be able to feel it, even though you may not be able to taste it, even though you may not be able to see it, that God is there for you and, and, and is giving you that joy anyway. And that's Peter that says that. And that's coming from a man that knows what his foot tastes like. And he's saying to you, even though you may have your foot in the mouth, even though the rams and the goats are running around causing mayhem all around you, you can have joy and peace knowing that all the chaos is temporary. That Jesus has brought all the chaos into himself on the cross. Much like how God reigned in the chaos at the beginning of creation when he brought all the waters and created land. Jesus brought all the chaos to himself so that when he dies and rose again, he can announce to you all that your sins are forgiven and that you have peace. And I think that's good news. It's being delivered from someone that knows what a foot tastes like in a mouth. I did it a few times up in Daytona. It's all right. And also written with a few drinks in my system, but coming from a dear friend who knows what pain feels like and wants you to know that God loves you no matter what. And we'll end right there.